All right. Welcome uh, back to E75. Uh, we can tell from the, the empty seats here how many slackers were clearly working on their projects up until the last minute, yes. But you are the dedicated few for whom I, I wish we actually now had something like pizza, but we don't. So. <laughs> Just, uh, coffee, yes. Scott will be picking up coffee for everyone at the break, I'm told. Um, so this course isn't so much about design and UI, um, and more, but rather more about logic and functionality. But I was looking for a place to eat last night, and I couldn't help but be struck by how bad of a UI this was. And so I thought I'd open us up with this tonight. So I was interested in one of P.F. Chang's dishes last night. There's a couple of them downtown. I wanted to check their hours. To check their hours, I needed to find the location and thus telephone number. So I have to find Massachusetts on this state if I want to find out the nearest locations. And you can only imagine finding a P.F. Chang's and say, Delaware using this interface. Um, so perhaps an example of what you can do with technology, but perhaps what you should not do with technology. So P.F. Chang's there. Um, I challenge you to find some of the smallest states in that UI. Anyhow, um, so tonight is about continuing our conversation about my, uh, about SQL and MySQL, a very popular database server. And along the way, we will introduce Project 2 uh, for those of you who are eager to get started on the next project altogether. But first, let me draw your attention to something you've probably seen already since it's been on the course's homepage for a few hours now already, the so-called Big Board. So per the spec that went up last night and is available today in printout form, uh, this is purely the fun aspect, uh, the other fun aspect of the project, whereby if you sign in to our implementation, CS, uh, the staff's implementation of CS75 Finance, you can partake in a little bit of a stock portfolio uh, competition over the next few weeks. We'll see who ends up on top. You start off with $10,000 by default, so it looks like Philip is already in the lead, having been up uh, $600 today. And if we scroll down, uh, looks like uh, Tay is down a few hundred dollars already. So already the competition is on and we'll see what happens in this, albeit short term trading competition, but feel free to tune in along the way. And we'll look at tonight exactly how one goes about investing his or her money with this interface. But last week we left off with the series of login examples. So recall that we worked our way up to uh, worked our way up to lectures four. Worked our way up to, ah, oh, it's not there. Worked our way up to, <laughs> this is why no one comes to, sec to lecture. Uh, worked our way up to this here example. So we had nine different versions of a login module, at least one of which should give you sufficient inspiration for project two, which requires that you yourself implement a login module. But I thought we'd start tonight where we left off last time on just one good way, dare I say, to implement the idea of checking that box so that the user doesn't have to constantly enter both their username and their password. So long story short, recall that we began by doing something pretty stupid, which was what? to remember that a user is logged in in, say, perpetuity. What did we do? So we stored a cookie, storing not only their username, which is certainly convenient, but also the password. Easy, and we coded that up pretty quickly, but probably not the best design for most any website today. And so we, we improved things gradually, and we introduced um, a progression of uh, approaches that culminated in using an actual database. And we used this database so that we could store an interesting, uh, we could store this reminder, so to speak, not just client side, which makes us vulnerable to a client spoofing the thing altogether, but remembering a bit of information server side so that at least we can do a sanity check. That is when the client, the browser, says, I am Malin and here is my unique number that you gave me last time to remember that I'm logged in, we can now check in our database is that the same unique random number that we gave them last time? And if so, we can automate the process of logging them in. Otherwise, uh, of course, an adversary could still game the system how? By scraping the, 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 that 
token. Okay, good. So an adversary could scrape that token as in you happen to check that box at a computer lab in, in Harvard's campus. Someone else sits down at that lab computer after you. They go through your cookies folder. They can now see not your password, but your username and also that cookie, which they can then present to the website and then get themselves logged in as you. That's sort of the price you pay for checking that box. And this is why bank sites typically don't let you remember your password because they just don't want to deal with that risk, presumably. But at least for most sites like Facebook, MySpace, eh, eh, who really cares if someone tries a billion different combinations of numbers to try to get into that type of account. So cookie mechanisms are perhaps more reasonable in that case. So how can we remember this token, so to speak, server side? Well, this was the ninth incarnation of this approach. So recall that the context here is this is login9.php, which was completely self-contained. When we pulled this up in a browser, uh, like last time, what we saw was a page very reminiscent of CS75's own login page, which recall looks like this. And everything was contained within this one file. So login9.php submits to itself. And then the controller logic, so to speak, is at the very top of this file. So what does this file look like? Well, the first thing we do is turn on sessions so that we can actually use cookies. And then I had these couple of lines, which won't work right now because just I've removed the username and the password and so forth. But you could fill that in at home if you so choose. I create a connection to the database here. Uh, then I select a database because a database server, as we'll see, can have multiple databases on it. But if you're only going to be using one throughout the life of your program, you might as well just select it so that your PHP code henceforth can just assume that it's using the default selected database. And now we're doing some checks here. So if the user's HTTP requests cookie contained a user field, as we called it, and a token field, well, now we want to do that lookup in our database. Is this the same username token that we saw sometime in the past. Well, how do we do that? Well, the syntax that we can use here, which is pretty simple, and we'll flesh out these kinds of examples in further detail today, is we can use this sort of trick. right? I don't really care about, you can do this in different ways. I could select from my database all the usernames and all the tokens that are in there. And then I could iterate over those and just compare every pair against what the user provided kind of lame because the database, one of its core functionalities is supposed to be the search capability. So let's at least punt to the database and let him as efficiently as possible search for this username token. And so I'm going to select from the database the number one for now, which I'll um, explain again in a second, from a table that's apparently called tokens where there's a user whose value is this and the token whose value is this. Now what do I mean by this? Well, these are just um, printf-like placeholders. The first one is going to be filled in, filled in with the user that's in the cookie. The second one's going to be filled in with the token from the cookie. So the net result is something like select one from tokens where user equals quote unquote mailin and token equals quote unquote one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. If there's a row in the MySQL table called tokens that has mailin one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, what's going to be returned here, obviously? So one, and this is again just kind of a, you know, a common trick. If you don't really care about selecting real data from the database, just select the equivalent of a Boolean value so that you get back in effect a one column, one row table containing just what? One. Just one. So you can just check is the, is the result, is the row, is there a row at all? Because if there is, it only can possibly contain one. And if there's no row whatsoever, that means the username token were not found. And so we execute this query here. All I did here was form a string to create that SQL query. I execute the query here with my SQL query. And then I check if the result equals 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 false, that doesn't mean nothing was found. It means there was an error, like the database died or is offline or the credentials were wrong. Then I'm just going to call die and inform the user could not query database. But recall that die is not really a user-friendly way of providing error messages. This is more of just a developer's trick for now, certainly good enough for lecture purposes. But if there wasn't an error, that means either we got back one row containing one or no rows. So we check with this function if MySQL num rows, passing in the so-called result set that was returned equals equals one, well that means we found the user in this table. And so what do we want to do? Well we want to go ahead and effectively, uh, where'd we go? We want to effectively log the user in 
which I can now not point that high enough, but recall that for these examples, the means by which we logged a user in was to set that authenticated flag in the session to just true. Okay. What else am I now doing? There's a whole bunch more stuff in here, but um, what else do we want to do here? So because this file is self-contained, I also want to be able to check if the user kept that box checked. And if so, I want to resave the cookie and update its expiration so that the user gets another seven days worth of mileage out of having checked that box. So I'm going to wave my hands at some of the rest of here and just defer to some of the comments because we'll come back to tonight what some of these queries are doing. But long story short, the takeaway there was one, we're finally using a database to do some server side validation. We're not really trusting the cookies entirely. But appreciate that we are taking on some amount of risk, because someone could certainly spoof that cookie if they probabilistically guess what that token is. But it's a low risk, but it's one to bear in mind. OK. Questions on the overall framework here? But again, this is available online, and I'll leave as an example up there. Uh, yeah? Uh, does the fermented MySQL now grows up as always? Is that what is the term? Uh, MySQL num rows, it returns an integer, telling you how many rows were returned. So recall last week that we likened a SQL table to just like an Excel spreadsheet with columns and rows. So when you execute a SQL query, you'll typically, if you execute a SQL select, what you're getting back is some number of rows and some number of columns. In effect, a, a sort of temporary table is returned to you, and that table is going to have zero or more rows. So what I'm checking is how many rows were returned. And so we'll see more interesting examples of this when you're actually querying real data and not just doing lookups, so to speak, just binary checks of that database. Yeah? Is Token just sort of like an extra field uh, to, to, for additional security in uh, addition to password? Something for out there? The token? Yeah. So the token, recall, is something that I generated server side. Let me. Uh, Oh, that's what happened. I'm sorry. I confused us there. I scrolled down too far. OK, so we were a moment ago at this point in the story. We were checking the number of rows. If we found a row, that is, we found the user and token, then we set authenticated equals true, and then we redirect the user. Okay, That was the story I meant to tell, but I scrolled down too far. If, however, the user has not presented this cookie, but has actually submitted the login form with their username, with their password, and perhaps with that checkbox checked, then we're in this block of code, which was actually throwing me off there mentally, but I was trying to wave my hands at it. But here it is. Now it makes sense. So in this case, we're doing, the same, we're doing a similar idea. We're checking the database, though, not for that token, but is the username and password that were provided the correct ones. And so we're doing that with that SQL query up there. Select one from users where the user equals something and the password equals something. And then recall our brief discussion last week about using AES encrypt or SQL's password function as opposed to just storing the password in the clear. And just to reiterate, why is it probably bad to just store passwords in the clear in the database? Easy question. All right, someone steals your database, now they've got everyone's credentials, which tends not to be such a good thing. Okay? And the rest of this, though, the story now continues as we were telling it. If the user checked that, bu that, bu uh, that checkbox, which I apparently called keep, then what you want to do is create a token pseudo-randomly. All right, not in this case really pseudo-randomly. But then I want to store that token and the username in a cookie using syntax that we used several times last week. And now, and this is actually how the whole process works in the first place, we need to insert that token into my database because we need to remember what token we assign to that user. Now, again, this is for lecture purposes that I hard-coded it. But the point, though, here is that we're inserting into apparently a table called tokens. Uh, the, a username, comma, token, so that is two different fields, two columns in your spreadsheet, two values, both of which look like they're strings. The first one of which is the username that the user submitted when clicking login, and the second is the token that I pseudo randomly generated. Yeah? Can you explain the syntax for time update? Yes, so excellent segue, and actually we'll come back to this later tonight when we talk about um, atomicity and transactions. but there's one gotcha that we might run into if I didn't have this on duplicate key line here. So 
probably just for my own sanity, I don't want to store multiple tokens per user. Because my hypothesis is, eh, if this user is logging in from a different computer, I don't want that old token from another computer to still be valid. Just to be a little paranoid, right? Even if the user has multiple computers, I'm not comfortable with them having multiple different tokens. And so I effectively want to clobber any old token when a user logs in, if they logged in now from a second machine. So the problem is in my database, and we'll again talk about this tonight, is if I want to guarantee that user is unique in my table so that we can only have one token per user, you can't insert another token for a user, as we'll see, if you tell MySQL that the user field must be unique in the whole table. So if I didn't have this second line on duplicate key in update and so forth, this insert would actually fail because I would be trying to insert a new row, a user and a token string, but into a table that already has that username. And so what this uh, syntax does for us for MySQL is it tries to insert the username and token into the table called tokens, but if there's already a duplicate key that is the thing that needs to be unique, the username. Don't insert a new row. Just update that guy's token field with the value of the token that I've provided. So this is sort of like a reflexive statement that says, go to what I put in here and assign it to the token field. So you need to assign user as a key. You do. So we'll talk about this tonight. But yes, in this table, as we'll see, I made user a primary key because I only wanted one row per user maximally. Yeah? If you didn't have that on duplicate key clause and it was a duplicate key and it failed, would that then return false from MySQL query? It would, uh, yes. In the MySQL query function for insert statements, I believe returns false if the query could not succeed. Yeah. Yeah? Is that um, on duplicate key uh, on my, uh, on MySQL feature? Is that supported by most of you? So I don't know about most, but it definitely is MySQL specific, but it might exist on other platforms as well. And other platforms provide similar functionality typically. Yeah. What's the, what's the triple equal? Ah, good question. So the triple equals, which I used up there, is for this reason. PHP is very weakly typed. So even though there's this notion of Booleans and integers and strings and resources and arrays, you don't outright declare the type of a variable. The result, the implication of which is that a function can return values of different types. Sometimes, and this is very common in PHP's own built-in libraries. Very commonly, will a function return an array or false, as opposed to the C, C++ world where you would return an array or, say, null or um, the equivalent. So when you want to check, just to be safe, that you're checking not only the value of a, of some variable but also its type equals 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 checks both value and type. And so the right way with PHP when you're getting back mixed uh, data types from some function is to actually compare the types, at least for the anomaly, like false in this case. So typically, though, you could actually get away with equals equals here as well. The catch is that in some contexts, if a function wants to return, however foolishly, zero as a legitimate value, an int, for instance, or false, you don't want to conflate zero with false in that case. So that's why it exists for that idea. All right, any other questions? OK, so you should find any number of those modules helpful inspiration for at least part of project two. So here we are tonight, um, MySQL. So this is an increasingly popular choice for databases for a few reasons, not the least of which is that it's free. And it's also increasingly high performance, um, and it's free. Um, it's used um, as part of, so th this course is ultimately about LAMP. So Linux, Apache, MySQL, PHP. So MySQL is the M in the so-called LAMP acronym. The best place to go for any and all questions about MySQL, besides the staff and each other, is the manual. So searchable on our website and also available directly at that URL. And I'll cite a couple of useful places to start when trying to answer certain common questions here. But we started last week to look at SQL and MySQL specifically in the context of creating some tables and selecting a couple of pieces of data and inserting. And we'll continue that tonight. Um, create table and drop table, this is the basic syntax for creating or deleting 
a table from a database. The catch is that with SQL, especially when you begin to create larger tables with interesting fields that have constraints on them, like primary keys and indexes and these kinds of things that we'll tease apart tonight, is that the syntax for creating a table becomes increasingly unwieldy. And typing it in, say, a putty command line environment, not so much fun. And you can obviously write scripts to automate this. But the tool that we'll be preaching in the course for both pedagogical and also logistical reasons is this tool called phpMyAdmin. So if you go to cs75.net slash phpMyAdmin, you'll see an interface like this. Unfortunately, you can't just log in with your CS75 username and password because this is, this, is the username, this is authentication for your database. And recall that via your panel can you create any number, up to six, databases for the course. So one of the first things that Project 2 is going to have you do is log into the panel, click the link called MySQL Management, and then under here, I think this was a table I created this past week or at lecture last week, creating a database amounts to clicking that link, choose a database name, like this will be Malin underscore lecture four. Lecture four will be my username. And then I'll choose a random password, click create. And now I have, uh, albeit in my browser window in the clear here, a gen randomly generated password and the credentials that I now need. So with all those login examples that we were doing last week and with login nine tonight, all those quote unquote blanks that I left in the file for username, password, these are the credentials that get plugged in there. So if you want to try out those examples, you can just create your own database and plug in these kinds of values here. All right, so let me go ahead and choose Malin underscore lecture four is the username. Uh, not log in there or there, but to PHP my admin. All right, so paste that in there. Now I'll choose the random password, paste that in here, and you'll get this interface. If I click the name of the database that I just created at left, now I'll actually get the interface for managing this thing. And I say it's a wonderful pedagogical tool because it just so completely lowers the bar to executing queries, looking at your data, troubleshooting problems. It's a wonderful front end um, to SQL that just happens to be written in PHP. All right, so if I want to create a table, what might be the type of problem I want to solve? All right, so uh, somewhat arbitrarily, but somewhat prepared in advance. Why don't I just create a database that's meant to store like um, a customer database? So I'm implementing a website that takes orders, maybe a la three aces, and I want to keep track of now my users by way of their names, their delivery addresses, therefore their cities and zip codes, and that kind of information. So um, how many fields? So we're going to call this thing customers. And how many fields do I want to give this thing? All right. What do we want? Name, uh, street address, city, state, zip. How about five? We'll start with that. All right, so I go ahead and create this. Now all this has done is create a template for me to fill out where I can specify the names now of my fields, aka columns, and also the types. And then we'll tease apart tonight now some of the attributes that you can assign to the various fields in a MySQL table. All right, so the first thing is going to be the customer's name. All right, and a name can be of any number of types, okay? And we won't go into terrible detail into all of them tonight, but one of them is char. A char is a fixed length field that can go up to, in old versions of MySQL, like 255 characters, and newer versions, like 65,000. So a person's name, though, I'm going to arbitrarily say is, eh, it's not going to be more than 128. I'm only going to allocate 128 bytes. But varchar, which is a more common choice, is a variable char in that it will use up to 128 bytes, but possibly less. It's more efficient, therefore, than a char. If you're really implementing a very high performance database, there's something to be said for having um, predictably wide fields for search reasons. So there is a trade off between spending more space and, in theory, getting better performance. But certainly for the project's purposes in this course, not probably an issue you need to uh, worry so much about. Let's call this next field street address. Let's call this next field city, state, zip. All right, what's an appropriate field type for street? Yeah, varchar, all right, uh, 255. Pretty common is for people just to leave the default at, say, 255, if that's reasonable. All right, what about city? Yeah, sure, varchar, eh, state. 
All right, well, I'm three aces. I don't really want to deliver beyond Massachusetts and maybe oh, New Hampshire, maybe. All right, so what if we actually want to enumerate a couple of possible values? Well, you could certainly just leave it as a varchar and therefore be allowed to store any amount of data in this field. But one of the advantages of using a database, an intelligent database, whether it's Oracle or MySQL or SQL Server, is that you can actually offload from your own code some of those constraints so to speak, so that your database will yell at you if you try to insert data that should not be in there, as opposed to you, the programmer, having to do constant checks in your PHP code as to whether some data should or should not be inserted. So I'm actually going to choose for state, just so I can save myself some work, an enum for enumeration. And I'm actually going to say that MA is allowed or NH. And I'm just going to put in quotes, MA, comma, quotes, NH. What this is implicitly doing is it's telling MySQL, if I ever in try to insert data that doesn't match one of those two strings, that MySQL query function in the context of PHP should return false, an error should occur because a constraint has been violated. So that can be useful, certainly. And how about zip code? What do you want us to put here? Varchar, Varchar int. Oh. int. I heard int. Yes, so those of us who've lived in Massachusetts for a while have probably encountered at least one website which for some reason says your zip code is 2138 because it's losing the leading zero. So using an int, while intuitively reasonable, is actually not good because at the end of the day, we care about leading zeros, at least in a five-digit zip code. So I might do something like five. I might do something like nine, maybe 10 if I actually want to store the hyphen. So we have some discretion here, but perhaps the best takeaway is that a numeric value is probably not appropriate. Harvard ID, same problem. Even I think a while back when we implemented for another course a similar spirit um, table, we just used an int for the Harvard IDs, not realizing that I think the summer school sometimes uses IDs that start with zeros, which was a bad thing. We had to fix it after that. So at least an interesting lesson to learn in advance. All right, so varchar eh, 255. We'll deal with the logic in code. But we could, actually, no, we'll be a little better. 10. 10 max, hopefully five digits, hyphen, four digits. And we'll enforce the digit, the, the format of that in code. Yeah? Makes sense to make it a char of 10, because you know it's exactly 10. Ah, excellent. So why bother do the, allow for the variability? We could um, just as reasonably do a char. But if we're inserting the same lengths in there, probably could have a performance implication, but unclear. But sure, certainly not wrong. All right, so collation. So collation has to do effectively with character set, the default of which is the Swedish character set, I believe, for PHP MyAdmin or MySQL, um, which is fine, strange as that might be, um, because it certainly comprises all of the English ASCII characters and some other stuff. But don't um, worry if you see some mention of Swedish in your tables. It typically, common practice is just to leave this blank, assuming your defaults are all set fine. Now we get to some interesting fields. And I unfortunately have to scroll rightward, but everything still lines up. So under attributes, we have some additional constraints that we can impose. Now, unsigned, unsigned, zero fill, on update, current timestamp actually don't relate to any of these fields. So I'm going to ignore them, but we'll come back to those in just a moment. Here I can impose a constraint that this field must or may or may not be null. So here, too, can you force your database to do some error checking for yourself? If you don't want any customers to be in your database without, say, a zip code, well, you can just preempt any such data getting inserted erroneously by just requiring that all of these fields not be null. Only if I changed zip code, and eh, some people don't know their zip codes, will that now allow you to insert data without inserting a zip code for a particular customer. Okay, so you can sort of design, take that into consideration when designing. Default values here, you can type in the default zip code. So um, rather, if you really want it to be anal and say, I want to allow uh, some, sometimes the, the person answering the phone at three aces doesn't think to ask someone for their zip code, but I don't want the database just to fail when they forget to ask that question. Let's at least insert a default, one, two, three, four, five, hyphen, one, two, three, four. That's the kind of thing you could do here. Or for name even, you could put anonymous if you don't really care about the names of your customers, just where they live, and so forth. So that's what we mean by default values there. And almost finally, under extra, we have some of these options. So just this one, 
which also doesn't apply to any of these string values we've chosen. But you can kind of guess that if we had an integral field, like a number, we can have the database take care of the auto incrementation, which is actually very useful for a problem or scenario we'll come back to in a moment. But for now, I'll leave that blank. And now lastly, we've got a whole bunch of checkboxes. And again, to be clear, even though we're talking about this in the context of this web page, this is just a GUI front end. All of this stuff, as we'll see when we click uh, Submit, is going to generate a SQL query that's then executed on our database. That's all PHP MyAdmin is doing for us. So if you hover over these pretty icons here, you'll see that this one denotes a primary, primary key, this one an index, this one a unique, and this one full text. So what does that mean? Well, for our little database, these things aren't going to matter a huge amount, at least for this first example. But in databases in general, and also in MySQL, you can define what's known as a primary key for a field. A primary key is meant, quite simply, to uniquely identify each row in the table. So with that said, given that definition, if I say that name is a primary key, what is the implication? for my database table. The, name's unique. the name must be unique. Because if a primary key, as key sort of suggests, identifies a row uniquely, that means that I better not have two customers with the same name. So probably not a good choice for the name field. Probably not a good choice for street. Certainly not city, state, or zip. So it seems right now we don't really have a primary key for this table. But we'll come back to perhaps a possible workaround in a moment. So let me turn that off. But what if? I do actually care in building out my Three Aces website. I want my staff to be able to search for users by their name. So someone calls up on the phone, say, this is Joe Smith. All right, I don't want to have to ask Joe for his, uh, his address all the time. I'm just going to type in Joe Smith, enter. And I want my database to be able to support queries. Well, out of the box, I could just execute a SQL query like select star from table where name equals quote unquote Joe Smith. But for large table, what that if literally is going to do is search the entire database table, which if three aces starts to do very well and has millions of customers in their database, that's a linear search time, not necessarily ideal as data sets grow large. Much better is if we can use some kind of you know, lesson from a data structures class, use some kind of table structure, some kind of hash table. Well, that's what a database management system is for, in part, to solve the search problem for you. So if I actually say that I know in advance that I'm going to be searching. My users are going to be searching on the name field. Let me define an index on the name field so that my SQL and the smart people who have implemented it does its thing and sets up whatever clever data structure in memory that optimizes select queries based on that field. So certainly for large data sets, it's good to give some thought to what your indexes should be. If by contrast, though, I do actually care that some field be unique in the table, but that it not necessarily identify a whole row, and we'll tease this apart over time, you can also specify that this field is just unique. And you can let some other field be the primary key. And that can be useful just for imposing constraints. But I would say it's uh, figuring out what your table's primary key, as we'll see, is perhaps more important than just defining a uniqueness constraint. Finally, this field down here, full text, MySQL also supports uh, searches of full text searches. If you, for instance, want to suppose you have comments about a, a customer, like this customer is a pain in the neck, they're constantly ordering and not being home, and you want to search for problem, some keyword that might appear in an otherwise long field, you can define some field as being um, fully a uh, full text field so that MySQL does its thing and figures out how to optimize searches on that field. Not full field, the full field, but subsets thereof, substrings. Yeah. Yes, so MySQL will automatically create an index for any primary key. Besides guaranteeing that it's unique, it will also do that optimization. Yes? Why not just index every single field? Ah, good question. So why, it's reasonable, right? If you care about performance, why not index every possible field? So this is one of these sort of fundamental computer science trade-offs. You can do that, but what's probably the downside? Inserts and updates. 
Inserts and updates probably are going to take longer because now when inserting data, MySQL is probably not just going to plop it at the end of the list or whatever structure is being used. It's going to insert it more cleverly. So you have to sort of amortize the cost over perhaps other operations. Um, space, though, is a huge one. These indexes tend to take up space. So if you start indexing every field, if you have unlimited disk space and seek time on your disks is not such an issue, then great, index everything. But typically, it's not necessary. It's a waste of space. Um, and you might end up paying a performance penalty because MySQL has to maintain those indexes as you insert new data. Yeah. Yep. Here first. Uh, so the full text is basically indexing the, the, the cell itself. The whole thing, yes. And then, it's an, and then so if you have like a, a cell that has a paragraph, mm -hmm. you know, you have basically stories that you have. You mm -hmm. search those stories you, if you. Exactly. So if you have a lot of text, for instance, if you are writing the next Google and the way that you index web pages is to have two columns. One stores the page's URL, the second stores the contents of that page, all the HTML or maybe all the non-tag content. You would probably want to define doing a very simple version of Google the content field as full text so that the user can do substring matching on it and do queries on it. As opposed to leaving all indexes off and then having to search the whole table top to bottom, left to right which is not going to be a very efficient operation, most likely. I'm sorry, I don't understand the principle of indexing in this context. Can you just explain? Sure, so by an index, I mean um, to index a table means to optimize queries for a certain field. So again, if I have no indexes defined and I want to search for the customer called Joe Smith, well, I can do a select statement like I was doing for username, select star from table where name equals Joe Smith. If there's no indexes, the only way MySQL is going to find that guy is if it starts at the top of my table and checks every row. Okay, so probably not ideal because this is big O of n running time. I can probably do better even with something like binary search, but that means I need to keep my table sorted by name. Well, I don't want to have to care about those details being the application programmer. I want my database to deal with that for me. So by defining an index on the name field, that's instructing MySQL, go do whatever clever tricks you know about to optimize searches on this field. Because I know in advance that I, the programmer, are going to be asking for data based on that field. Okay. Okay, yeah. Um, primary key is basically exactly the same as indexing it and no, that's pretty much it. It's, a table can only have one primary key, as the name suggests. But yes, it's this constraint that means it must be unique and it must uniquely identify. Uh, it must be um, unique, and you also get for free really an index built on it. Both unique. You can create Okay, so you can create other indexes. This is just a limitation of the interface here with these radio buttons. So let me go ahead and actually click create now. And I'll say that you know what, I do want um, name to be searchable in an optimized way. So I'm going to go ahead and fill, I filled in all those boxes, assuming I've made no mistakes. And do take note, we'll come back to this storage engine in just a bit. I'm going to click save. Now, to be clear, it's this syntax that PHP MyAdmin has generated for us. So if I had a command line version to MySQL, like I showed with the PuTTY window last time, it's like uh, copying and pasting that into that window and hitting Enter to create the table. So now, though, now that this table has been created, anytime I click the Structure tab here in PHP MyAdmin, I see the structure of the table laid out pretty much in the same way. But now I don't have the same kind of editable fields. And notice now down here, now is where I can actually start defining more indexes, for instance, down here. So you can actually make multiple fields a primary key. And a kind of a crazy thing to do here, for which we'll see a better solution in a moment, is that, all right, it's possible for someone to have the two customers to have the same name, even possible for them to have the same address, and certainly zip, city and state, but probably the combination of name, street, city, state, zip, those five things probably do uniquely identify a customer, unless there are two Joe Smiths living in the same residence. Now, maybe there's a father, son. Odds are not both of them are going to be customers from three aces, but reasonable objection there, too. We could define a primary key to be on all five of those fields. 
And I would do that by saying create an index on uh, five, or actually um, what you can do in PHP MyAdmin, if I really wanted to get crazy, I'll check them all and click now the primary key icon. And what that would do is say that MySQL will now check anytime you insert data as to whether there's an identical name, street, city, state, zip in there. But this is now, again, speaking to size, that's probably kind of dumb to have to check all of those fields. And so a better table from the get-go probably would have been to give ourselves a little hint that uniquely identifies these users. So when we talk about primary keys, almost always are you talking about a numeric key that just happens to assign a unique number to that row in your database. So I haven't completely messed up. I can actually go back and fix this. So you'll find in playing around with this that I can go ahead and insert, say at the beginning of the table, just aesthetically, I'm going to insert a new field that's called ID. Uh, it's going to be of type int. Um, the length you can actually leave blank by default. You'll typically see 10. This is somewhat of a remnant of the old command line version of SQL. You're not saying that it's 10 digits or 10 bytes. You're saying that when, you, when the MySQL command line program displays this number in a window, it should use 10, a width of 10. Okay? But it doesn't speak to the size of an int, which I believe is 32 bits, bits in MySQL. So just FYI. Uh, attributes, though. You know, when we're talking about um, keys, there's really no reason to talk about negative numbers. So I'm just going to number all of my customers from 0 on up or 1 on up. So I'm going to ensure that we never put a negative value in there just by adding that constraint. I definitely shouldn't be null because the purpose of this thing is to have a unique key. I myself don't want to have to constantly in code be checking, all right, what's the ID number of the last guy I inserted? All right, get that back, plus 1. Now insert the new ID. Let's let the database do that for me, and I'll tell MySQL, anytime I insert a new row into the database and I don't explicitly specify an ID number, you go put one there and just do a plus one of the last one you put in, which is a wonderfully useful feature. Um, and now this guy is going to be the primary key because he's going to uniquely identify the, table, uh, the rows, save, incorrect uh, auto column, and it must be defined as a key. All right, what did we do here? Uh, auto column. Get rid of that just to be sure. We don't have any auto columns, do we? So ID, int, unsigned, primary key, auto increment. Hmm, auto, it is defined as a key. Customers, operations. Hmm. OK, puzzling. Rather than dwell here, that's very strange. Let me, uh, I will debug during the break and figure out why it's doing that. That's a, I don't understand the message offhand. Any TFs want to find my error? Nope. <laughs> yes, we could delete the whole database and do that. Let me, just out of curiosity, I'll fix that. But. Had I clicked Save and had that worked correctly, it would have just added a, another row so that we'd have six, uh, another column so that we now have a total of six. And henceforth, we would start using that ID number to uniquely identify the user. So why is this particularly useful? Well, probably not in this case of just having a customer database. But the whole point of 3Ace's website and database is probably not only to keep track of customers, but also if they're you know, trying to mine their own data, what? So orders. So there's probably a table like order called orders. So just to give a sense of this, before we um, return to this in another context of project two, suppose we have a table called orders. Um, and just for simplicity, we're going to keep it really simple here. I'm going to have just two fields, one of which is called uh, customer ID, which is going to be an int that's unsigned. The other of which is, uh, let's call it the uh, yeah, order number, order no, we're not going not to do the, the two-way, though, just yet. Um, so what they ordered, so the food that they ordered is just going to be a var char that's 255. So the idea here is that now, and this is a very quick and dirty sort of database idea, if I want to keep track of what a customer ordered, now I could go back to the customer's table and add a seventh column called food, but there's a catch with that. What's the implication if I store in the customer's table what the customer has ordered? 
OK, so if another customer orders the same thing, you're going to have multiple instances of small pizza, small pizza, small pizza, small pizza, which is probably not the best design. Why not factor that out and have another table called food that says any time a customer orders small pizza, just store the number 3, which is the unique ID for small pizza. So we could do that. What's another downside of just lumping into the customer's table what the customer has ordered? If you only have one row for customer, order the next order, it'll overwrite so you only have one food. Exactly. So maybe we only care about remembering the last thing that the customer ordered. And therefore, it's fine just to have one field in which we remember their last order, maybe just so that the guy picking up the phone can say, oh, do you want a small pizza again? That's what you ordered last time. But maybe more reasonable for a bigger entity is to actually keep track of all of the orders. So for that. You could just start doing what with this field if it were in the customer's table? Well, you could just start appending it to that field and add a comma, right, in sort of the CSV type spirit. But that's not the point of a database. So over time, and starting tonight with project two, we'll look at sort of good database design techniques and how to do them and how to access them in this context. But really, the overarching, one of the overarching rules is going to be avoid redundant data in your table. And anytime you want to have a dynamic amount of ta data, it's probably a candidate for a separate table that you associate with a customer by way of what? Primary. By way of the primary key, that is the customer ID. So you have one table containing all your customer information and another table containing all your orders that pair via customer's IDs what they ordered to that original table. And in fact, if we really wanted to practice what we're preaching here now, we can even go back to the customer's table, which actually has a lot of implicit redundancy already. When I start you know, taking orders for, when I start adding customers to this database, where am I going to start seeing redundancy quickly? City, state, zip. So also a, a bad principle, a bad trap to get, let yourself get into is to start, again, storing data redundantly. We don't need a 1,000 instances of Cambridge mass just because 1,000 customers are from Cambridge. Maybe we should instead have a table that just has, is called the city table, that assigns a unique number to every possible city, state combination, say in the extreme, in the US or maybe in Massachusetts. And actually, do we even really need an ID number to uniquely identify each city state? Instead, we could just use we could just use the zip code, right? Cuz that in theory uniquely identifies and probably someone out there in the world has implemented a database that I can just hook into and query Here's 02138, what's the city state? And we don't even need to store that information. There is one gotcha if we start using zip code though as our unique ID. What's the downside as opposed to using an int to uniquely identify? So it's a string. We're already talking now five bytes, or maybe even nine or 10 bytes, whereas an int is just four. It's 32 bits. So there's this trade-off, too. Maybe conceptually and administratively, it's just easy, especially for a small operation, to use zip codes as the keys and just use strings. But for scalability, probably not the best decision. Because just think about it. You're constantly calling string compare on one, two, three, four, five bytes just to look up a value in your database, as opposed to doing a single register operation on an int. OK, with that said, let's take a five minute break. All right, so we are back. In MySQL, you have access to a pretty long list of data types, most of which are fortunately pretty straightforward. And those that aren't, um, the, man page, the manual that we pulled up the URL for before uh, makes quite clear as to the size of these things and the various constraints. But you should note that for data that fits certain molds, like dates and times and Unix timestamps, you should not get into the habit of just using, say, an int or, say, a, a varchar field when you can actually impose those constraints with actual data types. So that's one of the nice features here too. And as we'll see briefly tonight, there's also a whole bunch of functions that come with MySQL that allow you to manipulate dates, add values to time, so that you can actually offload a bunch of logic to your database as opposed to having to re-implement some very basic wheels like date, time, arithmetic in your own code. So that'll be useful to do. And you can also format dates nicely in your SQL queries, which is a nice thing as well. In fact, 
Let's turn back to our customer table, which I went ahead at John's suggestion and just recreated in order to fix the weird bug before rather than troubleshoot it tonight. So we now have this table, which does have a primary key defined as the field ID. So that's a good thing. And it is, uh, did I turn on auto increment? No, it didn't turn on auto increment. So let me temp fate and go back and edit that field by clicking the uh, pencil. Okay, so that time it worked. And notice, just FYI, this command that was executed here, this query that was executed of MySQL now is the alter table command, which made those changes that the GUI made pretty simple for me to do. So suppose that it's useful for me to keep track of when customers joined the Three Aces family so that I can keep track of when they were added to our database. Well, there's a diff bunch of different fields we could use. I'm going to go ahead and add to the end of this table one more field. And I'm going to choose this to be, I could just do a date, I could do a date time, or it can be a little more precise and just do a timestamp. Uh, so if I choose timestamp, and I've never understood why these fields are not sorted, by the way, um, but such is the way PHP my admin is. I'm going to call this the, um, actually not just the, I could call this the creation date, or you know what I care more about is the last modified date. So that if a customer moves and such, I know at least when this data was last touched. So I'll call this last mod. Uh, it's going to be a timestamp. The attributes though, I'm going to add this little clever constraint. So on update current timestamp. So one of the things you get for free with MySQL is this ability, which pretty much says any time a given row in the database table is touched, update this field automatically with a current time, namely a, a Unix timestamp, number of seconds since 1970. Um, that's going to do that for me so that I never even have to do the insertion myself. The upside is I can query this value, but I don't even have to worry about inserting it. So just a nice feature. Not necessary, but certainly nice. So just FYI with that. Um, so. The other data types, know uh, that there are um, binary large objects. So when you store things in binary form, there are certain fields you should use, like AES encrypt doesn't actually just store ASCII characters, but rather binary data technically. So we, you should, per the manual, define it as the appropriate field. We have floating points and double values. I think they're 32 bits, 64 bit, it's, uh, 32 bits and 64 bits, like in many languages. But decimal is an interesting one, especially as it relates to CS75 finance. Decimal allows you to specify with um, specific precision uh, what we think of as a floating point value. So with decimal, you can say specifically how many numbers should this, how many uh, digits should this number have allowable before the period, the decimal point, and how many digits should come after the decimal point. So by saying a length of, for instance, and it's kind of nonsensical, I think, to add it to this table, but I'll do it to illustrate the syntax. Suppose we have a net worth field for our customers uh, in down to the granularity of cents, and I choose a decimal field. Well, the biggest um, possible value you can have is, well, let's see, a million. Let's say they might be billionaires, but we only care about two points of precision. So sense. So nine uh, comma two specifies they can have you know nine billion dollars worth of net worth dot ninety nine cents, and it's not a floating point per se. It's actually um, stored with perfect precision. So that's a useful field for monetary values now. All right, so indexes and constraints, just to summarize, these are really the basic ones that you can apply to a MySQL table. PHP MyAdmin makes that quite easy to do. If you want to master, though, the actual SQL queries, again, just look at the little colored box that PHP MyAdmin presents you with when tinkering with your tables. And I can't emphasize enough, when working on project two and beyond, by all means, just create dummy tables called test or foo or bar and just start inserting data. Experiment with different structures. You can do no harm in your own little sandbox if you want to actually see how these things work before you actually create, say, your real tables. So we'll look more tonight and certainly throughout the course at other, at the sort of um, uh, the meat of SQL queries, namely selecting data and inserting data and perhaps deleting data or updating data. We'll do this typically by way of example as we already have with the login modules, but let me first note, um, just hint at some of those functions. So the list is far too long for any course really to cover ad nauseum. It would also be rather boring, but some of the highlights are last week we looked at the AES encrypt function, just which hints at letting MySQL do the actual AES encryption for you. Could do it in code, but 
MySQL can do it for you as well. And then I uh, cherry pick two very commonly used functions from the SQL set, namely date format and time format. Because even though a date in SQL, a SQL table is typically stored in, say, this format, you might want to get back something like Saturday, comma, 1 January 2008, or something that's a little prettier. Now you can, PHP actually makes this pretty darn easy, as do a lot of languages, but SQL, or MySQL can do it for you. So if you look up the appropriate documentation for this function, you can actually pass it, effectively, a date field, and it will figure out what day of the week that was. And you can have it, you can massage it using little format strings like percent this and percent that into a string that you would like it to be. So in fact, if I wanted to try this out, let's go ahead and, well, not bother adding the net worth field. I'm going to go ahead and insert the following into this table. So I just opened up my little um, SQL box. So I could do this with the insert menu, which gives me a nice little drop down. Let me actually try out my SQL skills here. I'm going to do insert into customers. And it's largely case insensitive, but a useful habit I think to get into is use all caps for the SQL instructions and then lowercase for your field names just to make more clear what's what. But that's really a stylistic thing. What do I want to insert? Well, we have a name field, a street field, a city field, state, and zip. We also have, though, a time, um, last mod field and what other field? An ID, but I don't need to provide those. Why? Right, so one was auto increment, the ID, and the other one was auto update, the timestamp. So I can get away with that. So now I've enumerated what fields I'm inserting. Now I specify the values. So the name is going to be Joe Smith. Uh, the next street is going to be one fake street. The next one is. Uh, city will be Cambridge. And notice white space in between these fields doesn't matter. State could be what, New York? No, this would fail, right, because of the enumeration that we specified. So I'll say MA. And now finally for the zip, 02138. And notice that I have put in quote marks anything that is a string. So ints and floats and decimals you could just put as raw data, but anything that's a string needs to be quoted in this fashion, even if like a zip it looks like a number. But you can also just quote everything if you want to be extra sure, even if it is an int or float or whatnot. Assuming I got the syntax right, good habit to get into is copy so you don't uh, have to retype everything. Looks like it worked. Inserted rows one took really little time. So let me see the result. This is what was executed for those who sort of like to learn from this interface, which is just what I typed again, color coded. Now let's browse. And now PHP My Admin just shows me the spreadsheet here, the table that I'm starting to add rows to. So now notice that the last mod time uh, came out as 00. zero. Why is that? Oh, damn, we left the default. Uh, no, I think that was my old version, though. No, Oh, no, it is this one. Thank you. So let's check this. Edit this with the pencil. And this. I actually want, because it's a timestamp field, update it with the current timestamp for the default value. So notice this attribute handles the updates if I actually update a row in the database. But if I'm inserting and haven't provided a value, I want the default to be the current timestamp. Let's go ahead and save that. Now it executed the alter command for us. So now let's go ahead and do this one more time. This time I'm going to cheat and use the pretty fields here. So this will be Jane Smith, who also lives at one fake street in Cambridge, Mass, 02138. That's already selected. And incidentally, let me note that during the development of Project 2, you'll find that it might be a lot to bite off if you try implementing everything before you, uh, everything up front before you start testing things. And that is to say, you could implement, as we'll see, the ability to buy stocks and the ability to sell stocks and the ability to check your portfolio and just hope that it's all going to work when you test it finally. Much better, I think, and much more reasonable is don't wait until you've implemented the buy module to start giving your fake users stocks in their portfolios. Use this interface, pre-populate it with some fake data so that you can implement other parts without, say, the buy part. You can implement sell without buy, but more on that in a bit. Yeah? When you're using this interface, you don't need the single quotes? When you're using this interface, no, you don't need the single quotes. That's one of the upsides of using the GUI. Let's go ahead and click Go. 
OK, now it executed the same SQL that I could have typed manually. If I now click Browse and scroll over, now we do, in fact, have the right date and time in there. So suppose now that I want to start selecting data from this database. What I can do is, again, suppose I only care about asking for select the names of all my customers. Select name from customers. And I'm going to kill it go. And per what I said earlier, when you use select, it's sort of like getting a, a temporary table back, some number of rows and columns. What's been returned now is this result set, so to speak. And that's just the name field. Suppose I actually want to do more than that. I'm going to click Edit. And, re and tweak this query. I don't just want the name, but you know what? For whatever reason, I want the name and uh, city. Because someone has asked me, hey, where are all your customers from? Just care about the names and cities. Let's click Go. Now we get back a different type of table, a two-column table. So conceptually, and in practice, this is what's really being returned. But when we're in the PHP world, you obviously don't have this sort of macroscopic view of everything. But you can only get one row at a time, as we'll see, as we've seen. Um, finally, some other tricks, if unfamiliar. How do you get all of the rows, all of the columns in a, in a row? Sure. So select star from customers. So that's pretty neat. We can get everything back. Or we can start imposing constraints. So select star. How about all of the names of customers? So from customers where last mod equals. And let's see if I can do this, even though it's a timestamp field. 0303. Uh, this is going to be really tricky. 20, 4, 6. If I really care about who was at it at that specific time, the takeaway here isn't so much the specific example, but the fact that you can do these conditions, these where clauses. So where last mod equals 2008, 03, 03, 20, 56, 58. Aha. It works. And so we only get back Jane. But again, per my comments earlier that you can, SQL knows about what it means to be a date and a time. You can compare against the time. So is this time greater than this point in time? Is it less than? Is it equal to? And so forth. Yeah? Just to come back to something, if you had changed name to the number one, okay. would come back with a one? If I changed uh, Jane's name to a one? No, Oh, sure. So now we can see that. So select one from customers where last mod equals that. What this will only return is that, a sort of nameless field um, called one that just has one row. But again, that's more of a, a trick, a, a hack, if anything. But it certainly gets the job done when, with selecting the least amount of data just to answer a binary query. OK. All right. So let's. Add one basic construct to the mix. And you'll see on the front of project two that we, also, we offer a few suggestions for readings and such if you're coming into the class without a SQL background. But for the most part, the tables expected in project two will be fairly simple in design. And we'll spend time in section this week contemplating ways of approaching um, the tables design. Suppose now, and this is an example that you can read up on the W3School site, which we've pointed you at a few times. Suppose that you have a database that contains info on employees and also also data on uh, orders. In other words, this is a company that has these bunch of employees. And the company wants to keep track of who's buying what office supplies from Staples. So we want to know which employees ordered which product. OK, so we have two different tables, one called employees, one called orders. What is this query, do you think, going to return, even though it's introducing some new syntax? It's still pretty readable. OK, so it's selecting the name of an employee and the name of a product, it seems. So notice there's this dot notation. If you want to be really specific, you can specify not just the name of a field, but the table name dot field that you want to select, which is important if you want to get data from multiple tables at once, lest there be ambiguity. From what tables do I want to select name and product? Well, obviously, I need to select it from two different tables, so from employees, comma, orders. But this last line seems to be doing something kind of interesting. So where employees employee ID equals orders employee ID. So notice there's a common field to these two tables. So in the top table, an employee is uniquely identified presumably by employee ID, which is just to say, what is employee ID using the terminology from tonight? 
It was defined as a primary key. Well, uh, the pattern via which you should typically cross-reference data in two different tables is by way of those keys. But in the context of the orders table, employee ID is now known as what's called a, a foreign key. Because it's a primary key, but in a, a foreign context. So it doesn't necessarily uniquely identify rows in the orders table, but it does in the employees table. So mentally, if you can imagine this, SQL supports what are called joins, whereby you can take one table and another and then somehow join them by overlapping identical fields in such a way that you get back a new third table that's really the result of weaving the two tables together based on some field. So if what we want to get back is which employee ordered which product, if you can sort of visualize it, it's like taking the top table and lining it up with the bottom table and maybe moving things around a little bit so that the employee IDs line up in the two tables and getting back this table. The name of the employee and the product that they ordered. So this is really what's known as a join because you're joining two tables and it's imp an implicit join here. I will show you in a moment the more explicit syntax. But that's the basic idea. And we'll see this in the context of project two, whereby you're going to be implementing, as you've probably seen, then this stock portfolio management tool for which you'll have to maintain data on users and also what they own. But you probably don't want to limit uh, users to owning just one stock. That is, you don't want to just have one field in the users table saying, what stock symbol do they own? You probably don't want to have them limited to just two stocks. That is, you don't want to have just two columns in the users table saying, what two symbols do they own? Rather, you want to have a separate table that can be any length in size, but that somehow ties users with stock symbols. And presumably, you'll do that by way of IDs or primary and foreign keys. But let's see the other syntax for the same idea, which is perhaps more explicit. So identical operation, different syntax, more explicit about the join. So select the employee's name in the orders product field from the following. Employees join orders on employees.employeeid equals orders.employeeid. That is, the query here is identical, but it's making explicit with syntax what two tables you're joining and on what field are you joining them. So either syntax is fine, sort of pick your favorite. And know now that you can do much more complicated queries than these, but these alone will largely get the job done, at least for project two. And as we ramp things up with project three, you'll likely pick up other tidbits as well. But this is some basic join syntax. OK, was there a question in here? Yeah. Yes. It must exist. It must exist, but uh, it should be the same as. Uh, I'm sorry. Um, Any employee ID that exists in the orders table must also be present in the employees table. Is that what you're yeah. trying to say? So you can, and we'll likely look at this in section, you can specify explicitly that a field is a foreign key so that you can have the database enforce those constraints. In other words, so you can actually do really clever things that we won't expect for project two with databases like MySQL and uh, Oracle in particular, whereby suppose I delete, uh, uh, I had to pick all foreign names here, Ola from the employees table. Right? I probably don't want to leave around, if, I, if we fire Ola and therefore d remove her from the employees table, odds are we don't want to leave stale data in the orders table, namely the first row there for the printer. So what you can actually do is in define in a lot of database systems, but again, we won't be doing this for project two, what are called triggers, whereby if you update one table based on some foreign key, primary key relationships that you've defined when constructing your tables, you can have this nice cascade effect where one query of yours actually induces multiple queries that sort of cleans up your whole database based on that. Um, or though it's maybe not best practice to just remove all traces of Ola altogether, better maybe is to have a third field in the employees table like current or fired or something like that, which is just a Boolean, whereby you keep the data there and keep track of her order history, but you at least realize is she an active employee or not. So other ways to approach that. But more on this example you can find in the W3Schools tutorial, which is a great place to start. All right, and so now perhaps for our most sophisticated topic tonight, if you will, what are called race conditions. 
All right, so this is not a problem unique to databases, but happens even in modern programming languages as well. If you've ever used the synchronized keyword in Java, you have tried to ward off this particular problem. Um, and let's try to introduce it by making it a bit more simple. So the way I was first taught this concept in an OS's class years ago was the following. You are a college student living in a dorm, and you have a roommate, and you have a dorm refrigerator. And both of you really like milk, and I, one of the roommates, comes home one day and finds, ah, we're out of milk, because I opened the fridge, there's no milk, I close the fridge, so I go uh, head out to the store to go buy some milk. Meanwhile, roommate comes home and similarly is thirsty, opens the fridge, realizes, ah, no milk, closes the fridge, heads out to the store, dot, 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 end of the day, we end up with what? Two jugs of milk, one of which is going to go bad because we don't drink milk that fast. So the problem here is representative of the fact that my act of checking for milk and buying milk is not atomic. It doesn't happen all at once. There's this window of opportunity whereby someone else, the roommate, can check the state of my variable, that is the fridge, find it to be some value, then go off based on that assumption and do something even though that variable should have been locked, so to speak. In other words, when the milk count is zero, only one of us had best go out and get the milk. But just by closing the fridge door, that's clearly not sufficient. So just to make things silly, in the real world, how might I have solved this problem? of getting two jugs of milk, one of which is going to go bad. A Put a post-it note on the fridge that says, gone for milk, so that the roommate does not check that resource and act based on potentially outdated information. Better, a padlock, right? Literally lock the fridge so that he has to sort of stall and gets, um, he has to, um, well, he waits until then I come home to unlock the fridge, thereby not being allowed to check the variables value. So again, this, ex this concept exists in other languages when you want to have a file lock so that two threads aren't writing to the same file at once. If you want to protect some shared state, like a variable in memory, you can you wrap a Java synchronized method around it and so forth. In SQL, you have, or at least my SQL, you have at least two options. You can just lock the whole table in question if you're trying to protect some piece of data or you can use what are called transactions, the latter of which tends to be preferable. So what does this mean? Well, let's actually think back to an example um, earlier whereby I might want to insert into a table with three fields, A, B, and C, three different values, one, two, three. But I want to update, but I don't want to end up with a duplicate row in that table. And so I want to just update those fields if, one, if that row already exists. Well, in code, how might you do this? Well, in code, just conceptually, pseudocode, you might say, you might query the database, is there a row with the value A in it already? You get back an answer. OK, that's your if condition. If the if is true, if there is a row, what do you want to do in this case of updating versus inserting? If there's already a row in there with the value A, you want to update. So if A is present, then update, else insert. The problem, though, might be this. Suppose this is a very popular website using this database, and so your code, and therefore multiple threads, if familiar, are running potentially simultaneously or simultaneously. So your code, your thread, your user and his browser might induce the query uh, if row contains A, but then just because of how the CPU decides to schedule threads on this system, you get suspended for a moment. So you get back the value true. Yes, there's a row A in the table, but then the threat you get suspended. The other guy, for whatever reason, has clicked the delete button on the website, the effect of which is to remove that row from the database. But then he gets suspended because he's had enough CPU time. Your thread gets resumed. You then proceed to do what? Continuing your story. You try to update, but the data is gone, so your update fails. And the fundamental problem here is that this act of checking the state of a variable and updating that variable's value are not atomic. They don't happen simultaneously, so to speak. Other stuff can happen in between those operations. So the goal at hand then is to put a padlock on the fridge to actually keep these operations perfectly back to back with each one another in time so that no other um, state can change in the meantime thereby uh, affecting one of your assumptions. So one way you can do this, and it's the simplest way perhaps, is with this syntax here. With my SQL, the insert into dot 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 on duplicate key update instruction 
is designed to be atomic. So that if there is already a row containing whatever field has to be unique, then the update happens before anyone else is allowed to touch that row in the table. So you get this atomicity just by using this syntax here. Okay, by contrast, um, and actually I'll defer to the, well, you can ignore this bottom line here because it's pretty much, that's what happens if the, ins this update is equivalent to the above if there's already a row with that value, like A. Okay, so I should have just cropped that out because it's not useful for the conversation. The top one is what's interesting to us. So that's guaranteed to be atomic. So this will be particularly useful, say in the case of implementing a stock portfolio management tool, right? What, or even, let's make it even simpler, an ATM machine. Right? If you were implementing in pseudocode an ATM machine, once the user has provided their PIN and swiped their card, and they click withdraw, $100, odds are the first thing your ATM machine's programming code is going to do is, if balance greater than 100, then allow the withdrawal. Right? But what if those two operations weren't atomic? And what if a clever user at like a, a bank, like Bank of America, that has all these ATMs side by side, somehow had two cards and therefore could get into two ATMs simultaneously and was simultaneously using both hands and at the same time hit withdraw $100. And just because of the way the database threads are scheduled, this, this ATM machine here says, if balance greater than 100, answer comes back yes, but this guy is suspended. This guy, meanwhile, similarly asks, if balance greater than 100, comes back yes, then he gets resumed, I get $100 out of this machine. I get $100 out of this machine, now things get decremented, and all of a sudden, just because of how the programming code is, maybe the bank only thinks they've debited me $100, even though I'm standing there with $200 cash. So you want to make that operation atomic. Now in the context of stocks, if you want to allow a user to buy a stock, and you want to prevent some clever user from having two browser windows on maybe two laptops, trying to simultaneously buy shares to sort of game the system, you're going to need to lock that check and that update. And you can use this syntax if you design your tables appropriately, or you can be a bit more careful about your design. So in SQL, and in MySQL specifically, you can typically, anytime you execute a query, like select or insert or update, it happens right then and there. The moment you execute it, it the moment you send it to the database, it gets executed, thereby potentially changing some tables. If, however, you want to do multiple queries and only save their results, so to speak, if all of them succeed, you can wrap them in what's called a transaction. So quite simply, the SQL syntax is call, uh, execute the query, not select or insert or update, but quote unquote, start transaction, and just say start transaction, then execute your first query, then execute your second query, and maybe you have some logic intermingled there where you do some check. Did this succeed? Did this succeed? If both succeed, that is, MySQL query does not return false for either, then go ahead and commit this transaction. So transactions are particularly useful when you're trying to check and or modify multiple tables in particular. Because sometimes you want to check this data, this table, see do they have enough cash. Then you want to go update this table and give them the new shares of stock. Then you want to go and decrement their cash balance in this table. But you only want to save those changes if all three of those operations were successful. Otherwise, you don't want to get caught in this funky state where either the user got free shares of stock or they got no stock, but you took their money. And that sort of thing might occur otherwise. So suppose just to. Um, so who cares, or how do you fix a problem if it has occurred? For instance, one of the queries fails for whatever reason. Well, what you can do if you're using transactions is you can execute a bunch of statements. And then if you decide, maybe in your PHP code, based on the return values, like false, uh, something went wrong. I don't want to save any of these changes. You can execute not commit, but rollback. So MySQL query, quote unquote, rollback. And what that will do is tell the database to ignore everything you told it since you last called start transaction. Yeah? How would you do the, the logic for if, um, if account number two is less than zero, then rollback, otherwise commit? So you would. Um, so we're seeing this only in the context of SQL, but each of these lines would be executed with the MySQL query function between single quotes, like we saw for our selects and inserts. Exactly. 
Exactly. Exactly. Okay. So there's one other way to do this, and unfortunately it's necessary on some database systems. So you'll note that in PHP MyAdmin, at least on CS75.net, and if you follow the link on the course's website to Cato's modified XAMPP uh, installation how-to, he explains how to ensure that the following types of tables are supported in your own local installation. Recall that when I created a new table before, I'm just uh, simulate this for a moment with a foo table. I said we'd come back to storage engine. So there's different types of storage engines, two of which are perhaps relevant today. MyISAM and InnoDB. So m the first one that I is selected typically by default tends to be very high performance, very common, and acceptable for, for most purposes. But it does not support transactions. So for more sophisticated programs where you actually want to use transactions and actually a couple of other features and are willing to pay a slight performance cost, you can change your database storage engine to InnoDB. So think of these as like the database equivalent of a file system. Are you going with uh, EX2FS? Are you going with HFS Plus? Are you going with NTFS, FAT32? That spirit is what we're hinting at here. So if you want to use transactions, your storage engine must be in ODB in this setup. Otherwise, if it doesn't matter, you can just go with the default. Yeah. Procedures? procedures as well. So there's these other features of SQL where you can define the equivalent of functions, triggers, these things, which are only supported under certain engines as well. Another good point. Yeah. Um, when we're thinking about this, we should choose one or the other. It's not something you can use in that. Uh, it's probably, it's not necessary to mix and match. And for the data sets we're talking, it really doesn't matter. So for instance, for the course website, we use InnoDB for everything, just so that I can use transactions without having to think about it when writing code. So, but you can mix and match. And in fact, with some uh, databases, you can even choose different engines, I think, for different fields if you really care. But I'm not sure if, I'm not sure if MySQL lets you do that, or PHP MyAdmin specifically. Yeah. Yes, you can change the engine after the fact by when viewing the structure of your table in PHP MyAdmin, click Operations, I think, the Operations tab, and it will convert it all for you pretty quick if there's not much data, too. OK, so there is another way, though. And in fact, when the course's website, a course's website of mine used to be on FAS, which, doesn't out of the, which didn't at the time support InnoDB, just MyISAM, we had to sort of mimic the idea of transactions by using locks. The catch is that locks mean not locking individual rows, but the whole damn table, which means it's not very um, efficient because when he, if you acquire a lock on a whole table, that means no one else can write to and maybe even read from it at that moment in time. And so if we had a really popular course website, which fortunately we didn't, we were only talking a couple hundred students, it was OK to just prevent access to the whole table for that millisecond of time. But certainly for scalable websites, not wise to lock your whole table. And thus do storage engines and InnoDB transactions become more compelling. But the syntax, so that you know, because it's not uncommon to be faced with a database you don't have control over fully, you can mimic the same idea as follows. If you want to lock, one or more tables in SQL, you simply say lock tables, and then the table names separated by commas, and you specify what kind of lock do you want to have. Do you want write lock so that no one can read from or write to this table at this moment unless they see the wrong data, or do you just want a read lock, which means every, anyone can read from it, but the moment someone tries to write to it, they're not going to be allowed while you're holding this lock. So same idea with file systems, if you're familiar. So lock tables, unlock tables, same idea, not as nearly as efficient or performant an approach. Um, so if you're using lock the table locker, the, 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 the row lock that we use in this scenario, and someone executes a query against the database and the that's locked, does it error out or does it just wait? Good question. Um, so if you, some, a thread has locked a table and some other thread tries to write to that table, what will happen? I suspect ultimately it will just return false if it can't be executed. It might stall for some amount of time. I suspect this is configurable though. I suspect it'll give it n milliseconds and then return false, but I'm not sure offhand. I'll try I'll remember to look that up. Okay, unless one of the TFs knows offhand? Okay, mental to-do list. Good question though. Okay. So any questions about locks, transactions, the reasons? 
It's a really interesting and it's a hard problem because it boils down to careful design considerations when writing parallel code. That is code that's executed by multiple people simultaneously, which is sort of the nature of the web and increasingly common on multi-core machines. Okay. All right, so here we are with CS75 Finance. So if you haven't played with it already, the staff's implementation is available on the course's website right there on the main page, or rather the big board, which is just the fun uh, stock competition. And you'll notice, and we'll start to uh, peel the layers off over time, this in particular is using Ajax as well. So I think every 10 seconds it updates itself. So during the day, if you have some stocks that are very actively traded and whose prices move, you should actually see students moving between 9 a.m. and 4.30 p.m. during the business week. So it's kind of a cool effect, and we'll see more of Ajax in the time to come. Let me go to CS75 Finance whereby I'm going to have to log in for the website so we don't have random internet people trying to use this. Now we have our implementation of it. And let me say quite clearly, we offer this one as sort of guidance on how to approach implementing a system like this, but this is not a template that you should feel obliged or really inclined to implement perfectly. For one, it doesn't have all of the features that the spec requires, which is intentional so that it's not just a replication exercise. And two, there are many different ways you can go about this. And I would actually encourage you to just think about the problem independent of our interface and just decide for yourself what would be the nicest, maybe simplest, way of implementing the feature set that's required. But let me go ahead and uh, do the following. I'm going to go ahead and uh, play the big board as David J. Malin. So what we've added as a hook here, which you don't need to do, is we have the ability implemented for you to register fake usernames and passwords so that you can actually play around without hurting your net worth. But when you're ready to play with your real $10,000, you can play the big board, which really just automates logging you in as yourself. And you'll see that very late last night, I bought uh, 166,000 shares of this Infinix stock for six cents each. So I spent as much of my 10K as I could. Um, I don't know if the stock has moved. No, actually this is the current price. I bought it at six cents. It's still at six cents. Um, you'll see from the narrative in the problem set that this is based on real, real life. I received a spam not too long ago, which encouraged me to buy this stock. Uh, it was guaranteed to go through the roof at $1.90. And actually, just a couple months ago, it was at like 26 cents, and it's dropped to 6 cents. And had I invested my 10K back then, I've pretty much lost all of it by now. But I'm hoping that a one cent increase can really help my returns here. So uh, we'll see if I can end up on top here. But among the features, you'll see is there's this ability to get a stock quote. So uh, Google, G-O-O-G, get a quote. I'm not even sure I could afford this. Yeah. So. $457 is Google's current price as of like 4.30 p.m. tonight. Well, how do I know that? Well, one of the pieces of functionality that you'll be implementing is, yes, this. doesn't have to look like this per se, but you're ne going to need to get real-time stock quotes from somewhere. And based on our own internet research, unfortunately, there's not a lot of good data out there, which is to say there is finance.google.com which gives you things like this, whereby you can search for, uh, let's see, recent quotes for like Cisco. So the data is there in the form of a website. There's what, moneycentral.msn.com. There's Hoover's, there's, uh, I mean, there's innumerable websites there that provide stock information. And that's apparently not, oh, yeah, there it is, get quote. There's not much freely available semantically tagged stock information out there. Thankfully, the folks at Yahoo have made this available to us, sort of. So if you go to finance.yahoo.com, you'll find if we search up a, look up a stock like infinix.ob and get a quote, you get this web page. And now back in the day, and not uncommonly these days, you would write what if you wanted to grab all this data? You do what's called screen scraping, which just really boils down to maybe massaging the HTML a little bit, but at the end of the day, using a lot of regular expressions and hackery to pull the data out of the page. The downside, of course, is that if Yahoo changes their website tomorrow, all your stuff breaks. Maybe you start importing bogus data, and it's this losing proposition if you're constantly screen scraping typically. Plus, it's a nightmare to implement sometimes, especially when and this sort of speaks to why things like XHTML are a good thing. It's sloppy HTML, where you can't make structural assumptions about the page. Thankfully, we noticed that Yahoo has this link here, download data, 
And that's funny. This actually changed since, oh, maybe it's an IE7 thing. It has this download data link here, which if you hover over it, you'll see will lead me to, uh, it's a funky looking URL, but a CSV file is what's going to be spit out. So a very popular file format, uh, besides XML, sort of before the days of XML, was to use CSVs, comma separated variables, which is really an Excel spreadsheet, but a very simple Excel spreadsheet. So by clicking this link, it's created this CSV file, which uh, Excel knows to open by default. You can open it in any text editor if you don't own Excel or the, something similar. And notice that there's a bunch of fields here. The first one seems to be the stock symbol, its price, maybe it's uh, 226 something related to its date, the time at which something happened, and then some other fields. Well, fortunately, um, a friend of mine and then someone also I found on the web has provided the world with an unofficial documentation for all the various fields that you can grab from Yahoo in this form. The reason being, it is so much easier parsing this than parsing this. Because all a CSV file is, is like a table with rows and columns, each of who, which are separated by uh, commas. Not that hard to implement a little program in PHP or even other languages that just separates all that data based on commas and just reads in every line from the file as though it were a row in a spreadsheet. Right? And in fact, PHP makes it really easy. The function that will soon be your friend is called fgetCSV which quite simply opens up a CSV file and then returns to you an array with all of the fields that you have requested into a PHP array that you can then massage. So what was the URL I pulled up? Well, just to be clear, let me go back to um, Yahoo Finance here and right click this URL, download data, and notice I'll use my little WordPad trick here. It's a long URL, but it goes to downloadfinanceyahoo.com slash d quotes dot csv question mark. Okay? So this is actually a bit of a fake. This is clearly a, a program, not a CSV file per se. But the question mark means here comes some HTTP parameters. It looks like one of the parameters is called S, and that is of course the stock symbol. And the next parameter is F, which I suppose means fields. And then they have this proprietary and, again, unofficially documented string that tells the server what fields to return. And in the spec for project two, we give you a URL to a list that a guy was nice enough to arrange on the web that just documents all of the symbols and numbers you can put in there so you can control what fields you get back. Because some of you might feel inclined and are certainly encouraged not just to give back uh, price information for a stock, but maybe the day's high, the day's low, the bid price, the asking price, and these kinds of details, all of which are available in this semantically structured way as opposed to relying on screen scraping. This incidentally is a little hack lest you wonder. Uh, browsers, especially older versions, tended to get confused if you were trying to download a file when the URL itself, it's stupid, did not end in a file extension, namely Windows. So a common hack for sites is to append a bogus parameter that just ends in .foo or .pdf or .csv if the MIME types were not sufficient for those browsers. So FYI. So what then is the problem at hand? Well, per the spec, there's pretty much six features, six non-trivial features that are expected for project uh, two, the first one of which is a login module. So the goal of this website is not, to be clear, just to recreate our version of CS50 Finance, but your own interpretation of it pursuant to these feature uh, features. So a login module, the ability for a user to log in with the username and password. We've seen much, uh, we've seen nine different ways of implementing that idea, plus the ability to remember their login if you so choose. The ability to register. So actually, to take a step back, for the login feature, you're probably going to need like a users table, similar to what we've discussed last time, that has at least a username field, a password field, maybe some other stuff, but probably a unique ID, a number, so that I can pass that around instead of a longer username. When I register, I'm probably going to be interacting with that same table. So rather than selecting from that table called users, probably be inserting into that table called users, but checking if someone with that username already exists. So here too is a nice opportunity for those uh, MySQL constraints. If I specify that the username field is unique, what that means is if Malin tries to register twice, the second attempt will cause MySQL query to return 
false, which I can then detect and code and yell at the user, hey, Malin is already registered. Did you forget your password? Or something to that effect. Alternatively, I could do a select on the database, select star uh, from users where username equals Malin, and if that returns a row, then I can also yell at the user. But the constraint sort of solves that for me. But again, beware the atomicity. Suppose that Malin, and contrived example, but suppose that Malin tries to register a second time, and you detect as much by having selected from that database, but you haven't used a lock. Because simultaneously, another guy named Malin deletes his account. And so now you're yelling at the user saying Malin doesn't exist, where even though he was just deleted over there. So again, contrived example, but same principle that you should think about whenever checking data and updating data in conceptually an atomic operation. So get quotes. And I've enumerated these here, incidentally, sort of as hints as to what I suspect would be the easiest set of steps to take toward implementing the projects, because each one sort of builds upon the last. So get quotes amounts to implementing at least one PHP page with a form, similar to project one, that asks for a quote. It has a button that when you click Submit, submits to some other page, call it quote2.php, whose purpose in life is to do what, probably? Probably go get that CSV file from Yahoo. So using that basic URL and then just appending to it s equals whatever the symbol is that I typed in, using f get CSV to parse the the file that comes back. And again, the on the examples on PHP.net make pretty clear how you can retrieve a URL with f get CSV and parse it. And then assuming I get back an answer, like I actually get back a CSV file that has real data in it, I can display the number. Like Google costs four hundred fifty dollars. Else I can say invalid symbol. I couldn't find any information. So that, that's a check you can um, make on that feature. Then the ability to sell stocks, which might seem a bit strange to implement this one first, but it's pretty easy to simulate buying stocks if you create a stocks table, or call it whatever you want, with PHP my admin, and just manually insert some rows that associate MSFT, Y-H-O-O, G-O-O-G, with user ID 3, which might be Malin. So then I can implement the cell feature so that Malin can pull up cell.php. I can see a list of the stocks I own, similar to what we've done here. If I go in uh, back to my portfolio and click our cell link, you'll see that I just made a very simple list of stocks that I own so that if I hover over my link, and again, this is just our implementation, it's going to go to cell2.php which is presumably going to implement the logic of saying, does Malin really own this symbol? If so, sell it, that is, remove it from that stocks table, and then do what, probably? De uh, increment my cash, hopefully. right? If I'm selling a stock, that doesn't mean just take the symbol away. That means give me back some cash. So where is that cash field going to go? Well, what table might it be appropriate to keep track of a user's cash in? Yeah, this is one of those instances where you could have a cache table that has like a cache field and a, a user ID field, but if you just have one cache field for every user, sort of why not keep it simple and just put it in the users table, which might be pretty use reasonable using what data type for the field? And decimal would work. You could use int and just store sense or take some other approach, but decimal exists for that purpose too. Yeah. Good question. We elaborate in the spec, and we say in the spec that it's fine for simplicity to force the user to sell all or no shares of a stock, as opposed to dealing with the mathematics of selling just some of them. But buying, we do require that you be able to buy more shares of a stock that you already own. But the spec makes that clear. So after sell, once you have the ability to sell, now let's forget about the manual PHP my admin uh, mockups and implement the ability to buy stocks, provide a symbol, provide a quantity, click submit. And on the server, odds are the script's going to have to get the current price from Yahoo, and then check time, multiply that by your, the quantity you want, then check your cash balance, and then if all those things check out, give you the symbol, decrement your cash. So there is sort of this perfect opportunity for something like a transaction, because all of those things need to succeed if you're going to then give the stock to the user and take away their cash, or vice versa. So perfect, perfect uh, application for that idea. And then finally, there's this notion of history. So thus far, we've sort of verbally 
discuss the idea of a users table and some kind of stocks table that keeps track of users' portfolios. Well, at least the one other table you'll have to implement is the notion of a history so that we can actually look on the big board or in your own implementation at what it is Malin has done lately in order to get, or let's say Philip, in order to garner himself. Hey, Philip went a bit crazy today. We have his whole history here. So somehow you're going to need to capture with a third table probably what the user has bought and when and the quantity so that you can have this sort of story to tell about the user. It's a lot more interesting to look at what students have done on the big board rather than just what their net worth is, which is um, less interesting in a vacuum. So that same idea there. So the common link among these three tables likely is going to be what field, to be clear, and probably something like a user ID. That's an int, and that's probably unsigned for simplicity, but that is unique in at least the users table. Any questions? All right, well with that, I will leave you with this image here, and I'll stick around for one-on-one -on -one questions. Otherwise, we'll see you next week.